Good morning, everyone. This is Muzna from the American Stroke Foundation. Welcome to our live Q&A on why failure is a part of su successful habit change. Uh, is the camera okay? I feel like everything's at a bit more of an angle than I'm used to, but... Okay. Um, so welcome to our live Q&A and why failure is a part of the successful habit change process. For more information on what we discussed today, you can visit our website at americanstroke.org and use the links to access our YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and blog. These live events are meant to hear from you, so please join the chat with your questions and comments. I also encourage you to share today's discussion with friends and family who might find it useful. Okay, so let's jump right in. The word failure sounds really bad to most of us, so let's talk about what it means for today's discussion. Failure is defined as a lack of success or the inability to meet an expectation. The problem is, is that we can read too much into failure. Too often we tie it to our sense of self-wealth, self-worth, self-esteem, and self-acceptance. To talk about why failure is a normal part of the habit change process, we need to talk about what the habit change process looks like. The information from today is based on um, James Clear and his book, Atomic Habits. I highly recommend it to get an understanding of the science of habit change. So the process of building a habit can be divided into four steps, cue, craving, response, and reward. First, there is the cue. The cue triggers your brain to initiate a behavior. It is a bit of information that predicts a reward. Primary rewards are things like food, water, and sex. Secondary rewards are things like money and fame, power and status, praise and approval, love, friendship, or a sense of personal satisfaction. Because the cue is the first indication that we're close to a reward, it naturally leads to a craving. Cravings are the second step of the habit loop, and they are the motivational force behind every habit. Without some level of motivation or desire, without craving a change, we have no reason to act. What you crave is not the habit itself, but the change in state it delivers. You do not crave, for example, you do not crave smoking a cigarette, you crave the feeling of relief it provides. You are not motivated by brushing your teeth, but rather by the feeling of a clean mouth. You do not want to turn on the television, you want to be entertained. Every craving is linked to a desire to change your internal state. This is important and we're going to discuss it more in a bit. The third step is the response. The response is the actual habit you perform, which can take the form of a thought or an action. Whether a response occurs depends on how motivated and how, how motivated you are and how much effort is associated with the behavior. If a particular action requires more physical or mental effort than you are willing to expend, then you won't do it. Your response also depends on your ability. It sounds simple, but a habit can occur only if you are capable of doing it. If you want to dunk a basketball but can't jump high enough to reach the hoop, well, it's not going to happen. Finally, the response delivers a reward. Rewards are the end goal of every habit. So, to summarize, the cue is about noticing the reward. The craving is about wanting the reward. The response is about obtaining the reward. Now let's talk about failure. You probably realize that consistency is important for making progress. But once you realize the power of consistency, there is a danger that comes with this knowledge. And that danger is falling into an all or nothing mindset. For example, if you're trying to lose weight, it's easy to convince yourself that if you don't follow your diet perfectly, then you failed. Want to meditate each day? Beware of focusing too much on never missing a day and then stressing over sticking to your meditation schedule, which undoes the benefit of meditation. So in other words, it's really easy to convince being consistent with being perfect. And the reason that's a problem is because that, that means there's no like safety zone or safety margins for being human. Part of being a normal human being is making mistakes, having errors, or having to deal with emergencies. Research shows that regardless of the habit that you're working to build, 
missing a single day has no measurable impact on the long-term success. In other words, it's all about average speed, not maximum speed. Think of daily failures as like red lights during a road trip. When you're driving a car, you'll come to a red light every now and then. But if you maintain a good average speed, you'll always make it to your destination despite the stops and delays along the way. So there's no way to get around the fact that mastering a habit requires work. Research from Stanford has shown that the number one reason why willpower fades and people fail to remain consistent with their habits and goals is that they don't have plan for failure. Planning to fail doesn't mean that you expect to fail, but rather that you know what you will do and how you will get back on track when things don't work out. Again, failure is, for the habit change process, failure is referring to, you know, being a human. And being a human means that there are ebbs and flows and it's not perfection. So um, not having a plan for failure is, um, Having a plan for failure is part of a good habit change process, and not having a plan for it is what um, slows people down and makes it hard to change your habit. So if you are focused on being perfect, then you're caught in an all or nothing trap. Meanwhile, if you realize that individual failures have little impact on your long-term success, then you can more easily rebound from failures and setbacks. Being consistent is not the same as being perfect. So when I earlier talked about the definition of failure, you know, we take it like as a, um, a reflection of like our moral standing, right? And it's not, it's just a failure. It's the not meeting the expectation that was set, right? And that happens, that's what real life is. Um, you can't predict everything and you don't wanna be so stuck in the all or nothing mindset that the stress of maintaining that um, outweighs the benefit of the habit you're trying to change. So I hope that makes sense. If you want more clarification on that, um, you can visit our uh, website, which has more information on you know stress state and learning state and how that's impacted. And then you can also refer to um, habit change literature that's out there. So um, there's another kind of part about failure when it comes to the habit change process. I'm not gonna to get too much into it because it's kind of its own lecture, but um, the failure um, to make a plan for failure, um, there can be different types of those failures. So you can have a how, like you can make a mistake related to the how. That this occurs when you fail to build like a strong system or you forget to measure carefully, or you get lazy with the details. Um, it's a failure to execute on a good plan and a clear vision. So that's the how mistake. You can also make a what mistake. These occur when you follow a strategy that fails to deliver the results you want. You can know why you do the things you do, and you can know how to do the work, but you'll still choose the wrong what to make it happen. Then the third is also called a why mistake. These occur when you don't set a clear direction for yourself or follow a vision that doesn't fulfill you or you otherwise fail to understand why you do the things you do. So there are different ways to account for the how, the what, and the why failures um, and strategies. But like I said, that's another lecture, but it's something to consider. So the habit change, let's do a quick summary. So the habit change process, and this is based on research, right? Um, is a four-step process or a four-step cycle. Um, it's a cue, it's a craving, it's a response. Um, and so you want to make sure you're clear, like outlining, outlining this is kind of a exercise I do with patients and clients. So if you're ever unsure, you can pick a habit you're trying to change. Um, so the cue is about noticing the reward, the craving is about wanting the reward, and the response is about obtaining the reward. So you need to figure out what it is around you that registers with you um, regarding something that you want. And then the craving is again about wanting the reward, and then the reward 
um, the response is what you do to get that reward. So if you know the four parts, then you can kind of break down where the, um, the breakdown is happening in the habit change process. And then failure is not a, um, it's not a problem. It's a, it's a built-in feature of the habit change process. So you can't account for everything that's going to come in your day. So having a plan for when things don't fall into place and how to rebound it is going to exponentially increase your chances of success. And I think like that red light example is pretty much the clearest example of I've ever heard of how the habit change process works. That you're going to have stop lights along the way and red lights, but as long as you maintain an average speed, you're going to get to your place, um, your destination, despite the stops and delays. So think of it that way. Um, I don't see any questions or comments. So anyone want to share their experience with changing habits, um, please share. And I think um, what I always used to tell people um, when I work with them on changing habits is that the way we approach habits is intuitive but not effective, right? So, and the best example I can, or the most familiar example I can give of that is like weight loss, right? Losing weight, there's no secret to it. Um, eat less, move more. But every year, people are still working on that goal. Why, right? So there's something missing more than the information. And that's actually how to embed things into your routine and recognizing what motivates you and what your reward is and what your cues are. And also planning for failure, right? Doing a complete 180 or trying to put yourself in a box of, I'm only going to eat this kind of food or I'm only going to you know, um, have this amount of food, like that will never work as well as being honest about what your natural preferences are, what your non-negotiables are, what your inclinations are, and make working, making that the best it can be versus trying to achieve this level of all or nothing or perfection. That just doesn't work. Um, and all those systems and products and you know, that claim to help you lose weight, if they work, they'd be out of business, right? So again, that should be a moment of pause for all of us that um, that it's intuitive, those kind of, that kind of approach, but it's not effective. Um, Aaron says, oh wait, oh, Herb says, is it, is mindset the key to the situation? Um, that's a really complicated question. <laughs> I'm glad you asked it. Um, so by mindset, let me know if you mean like willpower, um, habit change is more than knowing what to do and more than wanting it. I say that all the time. So more than willpower, um, because again, no one would argue with, you know, you, or you couldn't argue with someone who says, I really want to lose weight. I'm sure their motivation and their mindset is a hundred percent on point. Um, but actually making that change is hard because change requires energy um, and if you're already like unhappy with where you are I'm just using weight as an example with your weight or you're already burned out like then the extra effort to change something requires energy you don't have which is why the habit change process is so challenging in the beginning so yes mindset has a lot to do with it and also like mindset yesterday one of my students did a presentation on positive thinking like if you're you know if someone talks down to you, how likely are you to work hard for them? Not very, right? So if you're talking down to yourself or if you're in a negative mindset, how how hard is your brain and body going to work for you? Not really, right? And if you're also stressed, if you're in an activated state, we've talked about this in prior Facebook talks, if you are stressed, if you are tired, if you are sad, if you are angry, that's where your energy and resources go, not towards making a habit change. So mindset is an important part of it. And at the same time, knowing that willpower is not enough. You have to know the science behind it. Herb, let me know if that answered your question. Um, Aaron says, this sounds weird, but as a scientist, we look at failures as a good thing or we try to because we found a way that doesn't work therefore we can try another way yeah that's awesome um a failure in the research sense puts you one step closer to the right solution right it eliminates um 
and an effective solution. So yeah, I think, again, like failure, it's because we tie our sense of worth to it um, or our sense of um, how hard we try or what it says about us as a person. Like if it's, you know, not actually meeting an expectation that was set or it wasn't the intended result, like remove the emotion away from it. A failure is a part of everything. Um, it puts us one step closer to the right answer. It means we tried. It um, helps with, you know, it's not the, they say it's the journey, not the destination. It's the same kind of concept, you know, and we know, we hear all those things, but like putting it into practice in the moment is is the tough part which you know everyone can relate to um and in your stroke recovery journey you know maybe you didn't you know do your home exercise program for three days or maybe you and your caregiver have been butting heads for a week like you can only do the next best thing right um reflect on the past to learn from it but don't let it hold you prisoner so what's the next best thing i can do um, and sometimes, you know, they say take it at a day at a time. Sometimes t you have to take a half a day at a time. Sometimes you have to take an hour at a time, whatever you need. Um, but this is true for everyone. It makes you, you know, a shared member or a participant in the human experience. It doesn't make you an anomaly. Um, Herb says, what about stem cells being bombarded with ads? Um, so are you talking about stem cells for stroke recovery? Um, so that's a question that you want to direct to your doctor. Um, ads, you know, target people based on, you know, what you're searching for in the, um, searching for in your, use, when you use your devices. But, um, you know, if there was something that was a reliable, um, feasible, ethical, way to make a huge difference it would be like everyone would be doing it right so that's everything you want to that's something you want to think about and also when you see ads or newspaper headlines that quote research studies they tend to only take they don't explain the whole picture right they don't explain that it was a sample size of three participants and 85 didn't have a good response or that it costs this much money or that, you know, they only take out the part that's going to generate views. So that's something to consider as well. Um, Aaron says, just because you can't do something, it doesn't mean you can't ever, you know, what to work on. Situations change. Yes, absolutely. Um, habits, like growth, it, I mean, it's funny because the stuff that can give us hope after a stroke or, you know, as a survivor or a caregiver can also be the thing we use to beat ourselves up. So like the brain is always changing. The brain can always grow. Great. That means great things for stroke recovery and wellness. But then, you know, that means you also have to change the way you do things and you grow as a person, right? And as you grow, you have to change the processes and steps of your life because they may not be meeting your needs at this stage in your life. So it's a constant work. It's growth and work and working on yourself, which again, is not a sign of, you know, I had a stroke. That's why I have to devote time to this or think about things differently. Um, working on things, assessing things um, is, a, is a good thing. It's a positive. It's not a negative. It's not because something happened to you. It's because you are actively working on creating something better for yourself. So just a frame of reference. Any other questions or comments? Herb, you said, oh, the doctor was no help about the stem cell. Yeah, um, you know, I would just look into why, what you're actually looking into it for. Um, there's nothing, um, there are lots of ways to achieve the same thing. And whether it's stem cells or the latest medicine or surgeries or whatever, none of it is going to give you the maximum benefit if you don't live a well life. Um, so you have to have a strong foundation of sleep and pain management and physical movement and nutrition and resiliency. Like that's the, if you don't have that in place, nothing else, nothing else will be, you know, a magic bullet. So something to consider as well. Focus on things that are under your control first. Any other questions or comments? Okay, 
So the today, like, you know, this was a very simplified, very, like, basic introduction. The science of habit change can get as technical as you want it to, but I just wanted to um, emphasize that failure, again, is not, um, it doesn't mean the system's broken. It's a program feature, not a program bug. So that's a takeaway message. Um, and then also just a reminder to stay tuned to our Facebook page um, for updates on new recordings and education information. So if there are no other questions, oh, one more. Um, I'm learning part of my problems have nothing to do with my stroke, just age, Aaron says. And that's a really good point. Um, not everything is a sign of a like a symptom or a, not everything is a reflection of your injury not everything is a sign that you're going backwards or you're regressing or you're deteriorating sometimes it's just a reflection of again being human right so um i say that a lot with people who are worried about their memory right people forget things it doesn't mean that you're gonna get all like you're getting alzheimer's it doesn't mean you're getting dementia forgetting is a normal part of things um so don't when try to be mindful and catch yourself when you um, attribute everything to your stroke. Sometimes you're just being human and has nothing to do with the stroke. Okay. All right, if there are no other questions, I'm gonna sign off. And if you have any questions, please email us. Um, we wanna hear from you. If you have ideas on future topics, also let us know. Okay, take care everyone, bye.